This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger spoke with former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper about his new book, A Sacred Oath, Memoirs of a Secretary of Defense During Extraordinary Times. Secretary Mark Esper, welcome to the show. Roger, great to be with you. Thank you. Well, uh, you're known uh, widely in, in the Reaganism circles for uh, your time as Secretary of Defense. Before that, Secretary of the Army, participation in Reagan National Defense Forums. But now we are, we're happy to welcome you back because you recently published your book, A Sacred Oath, Memoirs of a Secretary of Defense During Extraordinary Times. Extraordinary almost seems to not give it enough <laughs> you know, credit in terms of what was going on. You obviously uh, had opportunity to talk to the public about what happened when you were Secretary of Defense. You waited until publishing this book, obviously, you know, deep a year plus into the Biden administration. Why did you choose to wait? Yeah, look, it's a fair question. It's uh, if you read the book, you'll see in the first five, six pages, I talk about how I wrestled with what what was my duty to whom was my duty. And uh, inevitably, it came down to my oath to the Constitution, hence the name of the book, A Sacred Oath, and what I thought was best for the country. Uh, at the time, I knew it would have been very easy for me to resign, step away. It would have saved me a lot of grief and heartache, and I could have gotten on with my life, if you will. But I thought that uh, it was important to stay for two reasons. First, I could continue to advance a very positive gen- agenda at the Pentagon oriented on the national defense strategy. I could modernize the military, propose a new Navy, beef up our cyber capabilities, uh, take care of our service members and their families, for example. But also, importantly, maybe more so, was I was in a position to push back on outlandish ideas that were being proposed for months prior to that point in time. I, I talk in the book about Stephen Miller's idea to send a quarter million troops to the border. The president pulls me aside to talk about shooting uh, missiles into Mexico to knock out the cartel drug labs. And then, of course, June 1st, when the proposition is made that we bring 10,000 active duty troops into the streets of America to to suppress protests. And so I wrestled with with this, particularly at that point in time, uh, you know, what was my duty? I consulted my wife, friends, my predecessors from both parties, General Colin Powell, and to a person, they said, look, you got to stay and and, and do this. You got to you got to keep things on track and do the right thing. And that's where I ended up with. And those who criticize me, I say, look, if you if you don't like the last two months of the Trump administration after I was fired, think about if you had that crew running the Pentagon for eight months and what would that have been like? So, look, I uh, I wrestled with it at the time. But I'll tell you, after I left office and certainly now, I feel all the all the more confident that was the right decision to do for me to stay, because I think it was the best thing for the country. Yeah. And and and. That's clear out throughout the book in terms of you are constantly wrestling with the contributions you're making and 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 commitment to that oath, uh, which of course is throughout uh, your reflections on your time. But in terms of writing the book, you know you have the John Bolton approach, which is you know you leave the position and the memoir comes out. You know almost feels like the day after. Uh, others who. Uh, well, let's take Secretary Pompeo, for example, who has not written his memoir that I'm aware of, and I don't even think one's in the works. Uh, in terms of timing, why now, not later, not a year earlier? Well, I'm, I, of course, I'm just the next in a long line of uh, former secretaries of defense who r- who've written books, so it's not unusual. Uh, from both parties, we've written books, and I think it's important to give the American people that transparency about their government, about their defense department, about the military. After all, it's their history. It's our history. They need to know it, learn from it, and think about it the next time they go to the polls or they, they think about the United States military. Uh, Look, I obviously was fired November 9th after the election, which is different than some of the other folks you mentioned. Um, I began writing within 30 days or so. I finished the book in four months. Uh, I sent it to uh, DOD in May of 2021. So five months after I left office, four months, three months after uh, President Trump left office, I sent it to the Pentagon for review. It took until October, six, seven months later, to get initial feedback. And they then told me they had redacted pages, paragraphs, sentences from over 60 pages or so of text. Uh, Important stories, too, such as the Mexico uh, uh, missile story. And none of that was classified. Uh, I still assert to this day that none of it was classified. And 
And um, uh, while I still didn't get complete relief then, I had to take them to court, which took another four months. And at the end of the day, I got nearly everything um, uh, undone. Uh, I was going to ask you about that because you came to the Reagan National Defense Forum in December and uh, I guess shared then that he had to sue the agency that, uh, you know, you have obviously led as, as secretary because of uh, the redactions and their, claiming, their claim that there was classified information. As you read the book now, uh, there are only a couple of places where you have language excised. Uh, how do you feel about that? Do you, do you, are you comfortable with where you landed, or is you're still pushing to get this information uh, included? Well, even the stuff that remains redacted in the book at this point, which is just a few sentences, I kept it in there just to make a point that I think it's unnecessary. None of that's classified. I just didn't have any more time to waste uh, debating and arguing internally with lawyers and policy people from DOD or the NSC. I need to get this book to, to print. So folks who say now, oh, he waited two years. I was pushing hard to get this book as quickly as possible so it would have provide some information as we headed into the midterms and certainly for Republican primaries. And so I had to turn off my, my legal point after getting 90 plus percent of my redactions back and wanted to move on and get the book to publication. But ninety percent was it was a win, and getting it out and this timing was also important to you. Writing it in four months. I mean, this is not you know just a, a couple hundred pages. This is <laughs> this is there's a lot there for those who uh, haven't read it and would like to. It's 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 quite a read. Secretary Esper, writing it in four months was a cathartic. Did you discover something um, about yourself about what happened? in a way that you didn't fully appreciate until you sat down and organized your thoughts? Well, it was cathartic in a sense. It, it gives you a chance to kind of get so much off your chest, to share so much with friends and family, with the American people, with history, right? This is about our history. But it gave me a chance to say all the things I couldn't or wouldn't say at the time. As I write in my book, particularly the last six months or so, I was skating on thin ice with the White House, and there were things I couldn't say. I stopped going... Uh, doing press conferences at the Pentagon the last two months. And I, I hated not doing that because I think it's important, uh, the role of press in society and, and for leaders to talk to the media. But I couldn't do it and make a mistake and get fired too soon. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about getting fired. I was getting worried about getting fired too soon. So I, I, it gave me a chance to, get, to share a lot of this uh, as I went through writing chapters and uh, I, I, I farmed it out to over uh, two dozen, nearly three dozen four-star officers, senior civilians, and even a few cabinet members to make sure I was fair, complete, accurate, and as objective as possible. Because I knew that if I wrote, when I write, I'm writing the first draft of history. Uh, and so it was important to get it out quickly. Look, this is the reason, too, I didn't come out and speak during this time as well, because I knew I had to go through a DOD review process. And uh, anybody that's subject to those uh, non-disclosure agreements or contracts, whatever you call them, you know that you can't speak or write on any of these topics until you get clearance. So I was forbidden from getting any clearance up until, uh, you know, uh, earlier this year. You mentioned, you know, you you're didn't want to get fired too soon. What an unusual formulation for anybody uh, in any job, let alone one serving as the Secretary of Defense, essentially uh, second in the in line as uh, in terms of Commander in Chief, uh, you report for Title Ten U.S. Code directly to President of the United States, who makes who serves as the Commander in Chief. For our listeners and viewers, explain what you mean that you were concerned about being fired too soon. It was like this is inevitable, but I got to hold on up until a certain point, the election, maybe until the end of the administration. Explain that, Mark. So after after the events of June 1st, uh, I realized, and, and so does General Milley, we need to recalibrate our political antennae. And uh, because the president is now 110 percent focused on his reelection. Um, and so I, I start drawing sharper lines, too. Uh, this is where the four no's come up. We could talk about that. But I, I, I know in addition to the four no's, which set these metrics out that that I would not um, do anything that would politicize DOD, that would constitute abuse of the military. Uh, that would be a strategic retreat uh, or that would be an unnecessary war, I, I had to put a timeline on that. And for me, it became the election. I had to get to the election, which was several months away, and eventually came election plus a few days uh, be, because of the aftermath. And uh, while I knew I was, uh, I, I had some life left, I knew that I was on thin ice. So I didn't want to make a mistake that would get me fired prior to the election because 
that would be the key point, whether troops might somehow or somebody might suggest we use the military as part of the election or in the days after. I wanted to be there to, to make sure I was a circuit breaker on anything like that that happened. Because at the end of the day, under the law, as you cited, only two people can deploy the United States military, the president and the secretary of defense. So it is a singularly unique and powerful position that I was very conscious of, of my authorities and what I could or could not do. And I didn't want an uber loyalist to put into this job, which I knew what would happen if I was fired. So let's talk about those events on, on June 1 and, and what happened afterwards that put you, as, as you just said, said on, on thin ice. This is when, of course, we have George Floyd's murder. There are protests erupting in Washington, D.C., in front of the White House, and, of course, across the country. And the president gets very focused on deploying the military and declaring, making use of the Insurrection Act. Explain what that law is, why it was so consequential, and how you, in a basically within your authority, uh, stood to make sure that your view was known to the president and to the public, and then how President Trump reacted. We, we had the tragic murder of George Floyd, of course, and that incited a lot of people to come to the streets of the nation's capital and other cities, of course, around the country to protest, uh, which is their right to protest peacefully. In the nights uh, prior to June 1st, uh, we had a minority of folks uh, out uh, causing violence. Uh, uh, law enforcement officers were hurt. National Guard were hurt. Fires were lit, et cetera. So we enter the Oval Office the morning of June 1st, and the president is enraged about what's happening in the streets of D.C. Um, in that room are the vice president, the attorney general, Bill Barr, myself, and General Mark Milley, and a host of others, I think, were in the room as well. And the president's up and down out of his chair. He's red-faced. He's yelling about how the protests make the country look weak, make uh, uh, make us or him, I think, look weak, and he wants something done about it. He calls for the uh, deployment of 10,000 active duty troops into the streets of the nation's capital. And of course, to do that, uh, that involves invocation of the Insurrection Act because you're now deploying federal troops into the into D.C. And uh, I immediately push, push back on that. I'm joined by the Attorney General and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff my view is that National Guard, if military is needed, is the best to do that. We had already had uh, a National Guard on the streets helping the uh, D.C. Metropolitan Police, and we could muster up to 1,200 as need be. And uh, eventually, Bill Barr, to his credit, puts on the table uh, 5,000 law enforcement, and I try to match it with uh, 5,000 National Guard uh, in order to get the president off this notion of 10,000 active duty. So you can see how the math works. And... Um, the discussion gets very, very heated, and we get to this point where he talks about shooting protesters. Um, we move on from that, but still the discussion is heated, and eventually we get him to a place where I, I, uh, I were able to get him to stand down and 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 uh, agree to the combination of guard and law enforcement. And with let's, that, we quickly move out of the Oval Office. Yeah, and let's pause there for a second, drill down, and then we'll go to your sharing of your views with the public, which, of course— um, puts you on, as you say, thin ice. Why was the president so fixated on active duty and leveraging the Insurrection Act, as opposed to leveraging the National Guard, which, of course, has been the approach presidents before him have taken in recent memory, uh, dealing with civil unrest and also situations like natural disasters, hurricanes and the like, because, you know, there are authorities there where you can get the military in the streets, as it were, uh, they're more trained. The the guard is more trained um, to deal with uh, situations on you know domestically, and they know how to do support to civil authorities. So where do you see that coming from? What was the what was the motivation? Who was talking to the president about insurrection acts? Not the type of thing generally. Uh, I think a president of the states comes to office, you know, having deep knowledge and understanding of this, for the most part. Uh, law that's not very well known. Yeah, look, I don't, I don't know. Is the short answer uh, one of the challenges you have of being a member of his cabinet and not being present in the White House is you never know who he's talking to. It could be somebody around him in the White House. It could be somebody he watched on, on a news channel. It could be somebody he calls up right in uh, from his inner circle. So you never know. But clearly, he had active duty troops on his mind. He had this number ten thousand. 
And uh, this is what was bouncing around. Uh, an another answer may be he just doesn't know the difference between active duty and guard troops and their different uh, authorities. You know, I had the privilege of serving on active duty in the National Guard, in fact, in the D.C. Guard and in the Reserve. So I knew it, I knew it really well. And uh, I, I just think these distinctions were lost on him. And in his view, he wanted a forceful response. And um, nothing gets more forceful than the 82nd Airborne, right, being deployed into the streets of the nation's capital. So uh, that's my best guess. I just I just don't know otherwise. Of course, then uh, subsequently you find yourself in this meeting, uh, you're called to the White House, and then the president, without sharing with you or sounds like anybody in the room, that they were going to take this wall, walk over to St. John's Church. You note that, you know, you see some Bibles in the Oval that kind of caught your attention. Um but you really didn't know what was happening. And then you're kind of in this position where, as you described, you're stuck, right? The president right. clearly wants you there. You get the sense it's not where you want to be or should be. Uh, and then, of course, this, this press conference happens where you're there with the president. And it really does seem to cut against one of your four no's, which, of course, you hadn't formulated at the time. But that is no politicization of the military because there you are. Uh, there, you know, General Milley, the chairman of Joint Chiefs, in his battle dress uniform, um, with the president. Take us through uh, that event and how it drove these four no's uh, and, yeah. and outline them. Well, you got the basics of the story right. I, I and General Milley are separated. We're heading down to the FBI command post for the evening, but we both get called back to brief the president on the plans for the evening. And by the time I get there, I'm told there is no briefing. And so I pretty much tell somebody that I'm going to go back out to, and get ready for the for the night. But they say, no, 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 you got to stay. He wants to go to the park, he, the president, and check out the damage. So one thing leads to another. And next thing you know, we're walking over to, um, uh, to the portico, uh, we being myself and Barr and others, uh, to meet the president. We get there. I say, Mr. President, where are we going? Uh, you know, what are we doing there? I, I get no answer. He steps out. We walk down a gravel, gravel path. And as we round the corner, exiting the White House grounds and into the Lafayette Park, you could see the throng of reporters there taking pictures and walking backwards. And we, we knew right then that we had been duped, we being General Milley and I, myself. And, uh, you know, my intention was to break off as soon as I could and go check out the troops and see what they're doing. But it was a bad moment, look, for me, but for General Milley. He's a military officer, and he's in, you know, as you said, camouflage. I'm at least a political appointee, so I got I can keep one foot in the political camp and one foot in the uh, in the apolitical camp, um, and, and so I got a little bit more room. But clearly, it was not the right place for me. Uh, I had said from day one and repeated it throughout my tenure that DOD needed to remain apolitical, and here we found ourselves at the wrong place at the wrong time, in in the wrong setting. And eventually, you know, there's the photograph and everything else. And I came out uh, within 24 hours, sent a memo out to the entire force the next day saying that we had to remain apolitical, that we had a duty to support civil authorities, to uh, respect Americans' rights to protest and uh, do so peacefully, et cetera, and try to reset the tone. And then General Milley uh, made a video speech two weeks later or, say, or so doing the same uh, to kind of regret, we both regretted what had happened on that day. But it did was the moment where our views on the four no's uh, formed up and a, a big recalibration of our political antennae going into the final months of uh, of the election season. Yeah, and, and and that was kind of critical and obviously dictated your conduct and approach afterwards. Um, now, of everything that happened, it was that press conference where you had a written statement, which you delivered uh, to the press, saying that you did not believe the Insurrection Act was something uh, that was warranted. And in your judgment, you know, civilian, uh, mil you know, military support, civilian authorities, this idea that the militaries are doing a support role, not leading role, uh, was the way to handle this situation. And then, you know, as the, as the situation in the streets subsided, uh, you were focused on bringing troops out, taking troops out of the cities. Uh, but that, for me in the book, was the most difficult Oval Office meeting um, and just reading that, it's it's you could feel the heat of the moment uh, where the president calls you in and calls you out in his judgment, in President Trump's mind, from taking away his authority uh, to use um, the Insurrection Act. Of course, you argue that you didn't remove the president's authority; uh, you simply recommended against him using that. But that's you kind of did limit him. And so take us through uh, that meeting and, and how you prepared for that encounter, because you clearly 
knew that you're going to be called in to the president. Yeah, so I'm watching TV the evening of Tuesday, June 2nd, flicking among many channels, and, you know, unrest is breaking out in hundreds of cities, and it just feels like the country, the republic, is getting wobbly, and uh, folks are questioning uh, what's going on, and uh, and uh, there's a, a, a lot of criticism of DOD in this as well. And I just felt the need that something needed to be done. Somebody had to put, you know, their hand on the wheel, a foot on the brake, whatever the case may be, and to settle things down. So I stay up late that night and uh, I write what would become the speech of the next morning. I send it out to my staff after going to bed at 2 a.m. And I say, I want to give this at 10 a.m. And as you rightly note, I begin by noting the tragic murder of George Floyd, expressing my own and the department's condolences. And then I, I go through this long series of, of, of statements, which culminates in me saying that I do not support invocation of the Insurrection Act. Um, anyways, I'm, and, and I say this, and I wrote this knowing full well that I would likely be fired, but I felt it was important to do. Uh, not surprisingly, I get back to my office. I get a call to the White House. Uh, I go over there. Uh, General Milley joins me, and the president is sitting there irate. Uh, Mark Meadows is to his left, and he, of course, begins yelling and swearing, uh, saying, I took away his authority. What did I do? Why did I do this? And uh, as he picked up his pitch and yelled louder, I tried to remain steady and uh, focus on uh, what he was saying, look him in the eye and, and tell him exactly what I went, did and why, and explain to him that my position was unchanged. It was exactly what I had told him on Monday, that I did not support it, that I did not take away his authority legally. He some way suggested I did, but clearly Politically, it had done, um, you know, to kind of undermine him in that sense. And uh, but I wasn't going to disabuse him of the notion that he could no longer employ the Invocation Act. And so we go back and forth. He challenges what I said at some point uh, in the conversation, and I tell him that uh, that's not correct. I know what I said. He challenges me again. And I pull out from my binder the statement that I had read and highlighted before going to the White House. I put it on the Oval desk, on the Resolute desk. I slap it and slide it over to him, and it pretty much. You know, he goes uh, deafening quiet right at that point in time. But, um, you know, it pretty much ends fairly abruptly. We have a meeting uh, to go to in the Situation Room on Afghanistan and eventually Iran. But it was a very tense meeting. I thought for sure I'd be fired uh, that moment because I expected so. And barring that, I was uh, that's when I began seriously thinking about resigning that day. Um, but important decisions like that are often best made after a night's sleep. But um, so the day continues on. It was during those days that I began disarming the National Guard, sending troops back, both National Guard and active duty, trying to diffuse the situation and signal that, uh, the, you know, the military was not going to be involved in this politics, that we would support law enforcement. And surprisingly, it worked. Uh, both my statement and the, uh, the actions we took, at least I think so, in terms of calming the situation down, the protests died down. Uh, the number of protesters in the streets decreased. And I, I thought it was a, a worthwhile move that actually proved to be effective. Well, I, you know, the president seemed to at least interpret this as boxing him in um, and was not going to utilize Insurrection Act. Just reading these events play out, going from that type of meeting, and then all of a sudden you're in the Situation Room talking to the president about Afghanistan policy, and then, of course, he, he moves over to Iran policy with a central command, you know, the commander of central command in the room. When you've just gone through that, I mean, the, the amount of discipline and focus uh, is truly extraordinary to be able to, to pivot from one to the other to the next. And then there's a reference in the book kind of explaining why you'd stay on in the job after that meeting. I mean, you obviously decide not to resign, but the president doesn't fire you either for some time. And it becomes clear that because of, I think, what uh, the chief of staff, Secretary Meadows says, or perhaps somebody else, I can't recall the detail, that the president didn't want to have to deal with the kind of pushback of firing another secretary of defense. And so they, right. before the election, that somehow, I guess, the assumption is he would look unstable or not in control of, of national security. And so, uh, Almost ironically, you you remain in the job uh, until election day because he felt that he couldn't afford to fire another secretary of defense. Talk about that and kind of how that calculus played into the days from June until election day. No, that's right. I, I read about this extensively that I thought I'd be fired that day, but then I realized through friends on the inside that uh, 
the campaign staff, at least, doesn't want to see me fired for the reasons you mentioned. It would really undermine his electoral chances. So I realize that that that, uh, that I have leverage, but I also realize that I'm on thin ice. And so that's where, I, I, as I said, um, I, I was uh, okay with being fired, but I didn't want to be fired too early. Particularly, as you say, I go from this meeting in the Oval Office, uh, very heated, to this Situation Room meeting. And at the by the end of the meeting in the Situation Room, the president is once again seems to be entertaining the notion of conducting strikes on Iran, which I thought was unwarranted and would really be disastrous in terms of getting us involved in a, a conflict uh, in in the Middle East for which we were not set yet or kind of informed our allies, whatever the case may be, it just didn't make sense. So all these things kind of play into my decision not to resign on the spot, uh, but also uh, knowing that I had uh, knowing that I had some leverage, I could do things like get rid of Confederate symbols from our military bases. I could defend the military promotion system through the promotion of Alexander Vimmen, Lieutenant Colonel Vimmen. I could do any number of things, but I had to be very careful as to how far I pushed um, because I didn't want to be fired. And that gives me a, a, a lot of time and room to, again, advance important things at the Pentagon while playing defense, if you will, against these bad ideas. And, and this gets to the real tension that you're in, and and perhaps it's, it's, it's kind of high relief for you, but must be with many who have served before you, where on the one hand, you're there and as appointee of the president of the United States, and you serve at the president's pleasure. And you're there because of the president. You're not elected. On the other hand, you have your oath. And of course, that is the, the name of your book and kind of is the almost bookend of your book as well, in terms of your, your guiding light. But to go ahead and, and be in the Pentagon and preventing, you know, let's, let's talk about your, your four no's, two we'll, we'll, we haven't focused as much on, which is, you know, no strategic re retreats and no unnecessary wars. At the same time, those are things perhaps the president wants to do. And I guess what I was wrestling with as, in trying to understand you and, and, and the tensions uh, that you were managing is the Secretary of Defense, just like any other cabinet official, should be serving the president. That's the one elected person, for good or for bad. You should do what that president wants. At the same time, you have to uphold the Constitution. Um, when it comes to unnecessary wars, for example— you know, Iran figures throughout the book. That's not a constitutional thing, is it? I mean, it's simply you don't think the president is going down the right path and you're advising him against it. But in the, the day, that's the president's call, right? Right, right. Look, you're, you're, you're digging deep, which is good. This is a good discussion. I think it's—I hope people will study this because, look, first and foremost, your oath is to the Constitution, not to the president, not to a party, not to a philosophy. It's to the Constitution. But you get this pesky thing called Article 2 in the Constitution, which says you have a president, and he's the commander-in-chief, and you're bound to follow his orders and direction. Uh, the good thing about working for President Trump is he so rarely gave orders. Uh, I can only—the the most vivid example is, the, is moving 10,000 troops or so out of Germany. But he rarely gave them. And, um, and, and so I never had to—I I never disobeyed an order from the president. And my style was always, from day one, with every boss I had, frankly— was to uh, take back his ideas, uh, what he wanted to do, and, and bring back additional courses of action, things that can improve upon his idea, and where I had to push back. But, but the, the 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 constitutional conundrum was not something I never really had to face because the president rarely gave orders. If the president had given an order, uh, something which I found certainly uh, illegal, immoral, or unethical, and I said this at my confirmation hearing, I would not obey it. I resign on the spot. But once once the four no's came about, I felt I had the similar obligation to at least push back. And if he pressed and gave me an order, I resigned on the spot. It was that simple. But I never we never got to that situation. Like I said, I was able on so many occasions uh, by myself or with General Milley or with Bill Barr or some case with Mike Pompeo to push back on some of the more outlandish ideas that were coming from the White House. Makes sense. So it is quite interesting that the president rarely gave the order, although you knew what he wanted he was trying to get you to do it, but not directing you to do so. Why is that, Mark Esper? Why, why would the president, who clearly had these very uh, tangible areas that he wanted to move on, whether it's leaving NATO, whether it's removing troops from Korea, whether it was striking Iran—I mean, this figures throughout your book— 
He never put you, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, in a position where you simply just had to say, yes, sir, or resign. Why didn't that happen? Yeah, I can't explain it. And obviously, it wasn't unique to me. I think it was with all the cabinet members and people around him. One theory was always he simply didn't want to own the decision. So he would throw ideas out. He would suggest. He would muse. He would kind of think out loud, hoping somebody would jump on it and run with it. And too often, people around him in the White House, either White House staff or NSC, would do exactly that. They would take an idea and they would run with it. You know, the quarter million troops to the border or striking Iran or, you know, blockade uh, or interdictions of Venezuelan ships, you name it. And it was the responsibility of the cabinet members, I thought, to push back on these things and just say, look, Mr. President, this doesn't make sense. And that would usually, uh, that would usually back him off. Uh, so I, I just don't think he wanted to own the decision. And, uh, and the responsibility for it. That's, but that's just speculation on my part. No, I understand. You know, one of the things that you capture in the book is the dueling priorities the president had. Um, you're managing Iran. You know the president wants to strike, but also the president doesn't want to go to war. Right. And in your recommendations, yeah. in, in your assessment of the options, you, you keep the president focused on both priorities. Uh, which seemed to be effective and, and, and helped you throughout. Um, and that was one where, you know, you really were forcing the president to contend with himself. You know, to the degree that the president was unpredictable, there, there were some things that he was true to himself. And one of them was he just did not want to get involved in more wars. And as long as you and he would listen to that, as long as you could say, Mr. President, if, if, you, if we do this, there's a good chance we'll be involved in a war. And if there is, then I need to get ready for it. I need to pre-position troops. I need to get allied support, all this other stuff. But and that was usually enough to kind of pull him back. And I wasn't trying to play him as much as say, is if we're gonna, if there's a chance we're gonna get involved in a big war, let's be ready for it. Uh, and, and and let's do it right, uh, not just wander into it. And again, he was true to himself uh, in, in that regard. So much to discuss about this book. I want to go to one episode, which I don't think's been covered, but uh, got my attention. Uh, but, you know, from your time as Secretary of the Army and all the good work you did there uh, to managing, uh, you know, the, the, the force, the readiness of the force, rebuilding the military reference, you know, cyber capabilities, Space Force, it really did so much inside the, the five walls of the Pentagon. People should, should read this book and, and get a full appreciation of what you were doing in the Pentagon while at the same time managing and dealing with the president in the White House. Of course, that's always the challenge of being a Secretary of Defense. But you had pretty unique challenges. The one I want to focus on uh, happens before these events of June, which we've just focused on, uh, dealing with when the president had the Joint Chiefs at the White House, and he's unhappy, uh, negative in terms of the military's capabilities, uh, pessimistic in terms of the military's ability to counter China, and the treatment uh, you observed that the president gave to our Joint Chiefs of Staff. Tell me about that meeting and, and, and why you decided to focus on it. it was actually, you focus on it almost as a retrospective after you've introduced um, uh, what happened in, in June. Tell us more about what happened then. Yeah, in fact, in some ways, it's, it's, it's why writing a book is so important rather than just telling an anecdote, because context matters. And one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and it kind of sets the stage for everything that might follow. In this case, it was May 9th, I think, 2020. It was a Saturday afternoon. The National Security Advisor thought it would be a good idea to come in and brief on a Saturday afternoon the president on China. Uh, I thought it would be good to brief the president on China as well. But again, I was uncomfortable with how he might react with the, with the Joint Chiefs. Uh, and I was very concerned that it might play out the way he, it did. But anyways, we're sitting in the, um, in the cabinet room uh, waiting for him to come in. And he comes in and you could clearly tell that he was upset about something. We sit down, and very soon thereafter, again, he's he's ranting and raging about. Um, he's not yelling, but he's you know a, a high pitch or high level of volume, complaining about the Navy. The Navy looks ugly. The you know Germany is ripping us off with NATO. The the great United States military can't beat Afghanistan. How how do you think you can beat beat uh, the Chinese? And this kind of goes on for ten minutes or so. And, you know, here I am at different points trying to interject and push back or trying to get him off the soundtrack to, to focus on 
what the Joint Chiefs had to say. And just with no luck, Millie tries as well. Neither of us have much luck. And I just thought it was just a very bad moment for him and for the Joint Chiefs. And, it, it, it you know, it just did not play well. He As much as he put the, the four stars on a pedestal pu publicly, he could quickly berate them privately. And this was just a poor performance by uh, against uh, all of DOD and look, me and Millie, which is fine, but these uh, four stars who had committed their lives to serving the country, served in combat, left their families for long periods of time, just a terrible display. And uh, I think as you're getting to some months later. Uh, yeah, it says I'll months you later, ahead. you had uh, uh, one of the members who, who was in that meeting um, said that he was so uh, concerned about what he had seen that he started reading up on the 25th Amendment and the role of the cabinet as a check on the president. Of course, this is this is if the president's not mentally fit. There's the 25th Amendment contemplates the removal of the president. And you subsequently write that, hey, the president's been in a program outlandish, but never rose to the level that you thought warranted consideration of the 25th Amendment. That's what you wrote. Uh, were you surprised to, to get that assessment from one of the four stars who was in the room? Yeah, I actually was. It, it didn't come till after I left office uh, and we spoke, and I was surprised that he was that concerned. Uh, partly, you know, that was one of the reasons why I was concerned about the meeting in the first place. You know, Millie and I were kind of immune, if you will, to to the president's mood swings and his, you know, his his uh, uh, his tirades, if you will. But the Joint Chiefs had never been exposed to that, and I think that's what set this officer off uh, and, and kind of caused him to think that way. You know, the, the 25th Amendment has a pretty high bar about incapacitation. I never saw the president at that level, at least at that point in time. And uh, I never saw, he, he behaved erratically things, erratically things that concern me, but but never enough to kind of consider uh, the 25th Amendment. But to this officer, it did. And it, it's it's telling about how people react different ways and, 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 the, and the impressions that the president can convey on folks. We only have a few minutes left. I do want to get your take on some of the current events playing out now that, of course, uh, you worked on and helped shape during your time as secretary. Uh, we, we didn't get into the events that took place after uh, you left the, the Pentagon January 6th, which uh, you've, of course, weighed in on publicly, uh, joined in a letter with all living secretaries of defense, highlighting the concerns and the threat and democracy that played out on January 6th. Uh, that's all for folks to read when they pick up your book, um, A Sacred Oath here with Secretary, former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper. Uh, let's, let's move to a couple of uh, issues that were important when you were in office and are uh, in the headlines today. Let's start with Ukraine. You worked hard and your Department of Defense worked hard in terms of training and equipping the Ukrainians. Uh, were you surprised uh, at the assessments that the Ukrainians early on, that our intelligence community felt that they wouldn't be able to hold on. Um, and of course, that didn't play out. The Ukrainians have been spirited defenders of their freedom and their sovereignty. Based on what you saw and how you helped them and following this issue, not only as a Secretary of Defense, but before that as a Secretary of the Army, were you surprised by the assessment and what the Ukrainians have done since? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the two, some, two of the biggest surprises of the conflict of, uh, of Vladimir Putin's unwarranted, illicit, unprovoked incursion, invasion of U Ukraine was, number one, that the Russian army isn't as good as we thought. And number two is that the Ukrainian army fought far better than we ever expected. You know, I visited uh, Lviv in western Ukraine in early 2018 and watched American forces as Secretary of Army train the Ukrainians. And I had a lot of confidence then that we were doing the right thing. And look, I think the Trump administration deserves credit for that and for approving the lethal defensive weapon cells. Uh, but no, I look, uh, it, it comes down to leadership and, and bravery and willingness to fight in warfare. And I think the Ukrainians are showing all three. And I said from day one that it was a strategic failure by Vladimir Putin because he unified NATO. He pushed the Ukrainians more in our, Europe, in our orbit. And he managed to deploy more uh, NATO troops onto his flank. And look what's happening now. We got uh, two new countries, uh, Finland and Sweden, uh, applying for admission to NATO. Let's talk about that, because you found yourself in the heart of this discussion with the president of the United States. On the one hand, you know, I've known you for some time. I think you would agree with the sentiment of the president that the free rider problem was a real problem, is a real problem. NATO allies not doing enough in support of their own defense. Obviously, that was an animating concern for the president. But at the same time, when the president articulated his view and shared his 
view that. We should pull out of NATO. You know, I know you, Mark, you, that, that's something you wouldn't support. You always recognize that uh, our allies uh, were one of our greatest assets, if not the greatest asset. Now that we have Finland and Sweden applying for NATO membership, do you think it's something that President Trump would embrace? Because these are capable allies. These are allies that actually, particularly in the case of Finland, they're over 2% GDP. They are very serious about their national defense. If you had to go brief President Trump and, and, and encourage him to support Finland's accession to NATO and Sweden's accession to NATO, do you think he'd buy in? Uh, well, first of all, I think you summed the things up uh, properly. I, you know, President advanced a lot of good policies. Many Republicans supported them, but too often he would go too far. He was absolutely right to call out the allies for not living up to their 2 percent commitment and doing more in terms of their own military readiness. And look, I served in NATO in the early 90s. I'm a big believer in the alliance, and I echoed that same and pushed that same view. But he would go too far in terms of suggesting that we would withdraw from NATO, and that would rattle the alliance. And that's where I kind of drew the line. And uh, uh, look, uh, with regard, e even today, fewer than 10, 10 allies, I think, uh, out of 30 meet the 2 percent. I think it's guesswork, but I think that uh, Secretary Pompeo and I would make the case that Sweden and Finland deserve to be in. There's thriving democracy, strong economies. Uh, at least Sweden, I know, is meeting its 2 percent mark. They bring military capability and geopolitical positioning. And I think for all those reasons, we would convince him that that would be the right thing to do. One more on current events, then we'll go to our lightning round. We're with Secretary Mark Esper discussing his new book, A Sacred Oath. Uh, great discussion. We recently had uh, the Biden administration's Deputy Secretary of Defense, someone he know well, Dr. Kath Hicks. Uh, here at the Reagan Institute, and we were talking about something I know is very near and dear to you and a focus when you were Army Secretary and, of course, Secretary of Defense, which is a national defense strategy. And one thing I put to her, but I'd love to get your take on, is whether the Biden national defense strategy, it's not public, but there, at least there's a fact sheet on it, whether that reflects more continuity than change from the Trump administration national defense strategy, one that you worked hard to implement. What's your take on the Biden national defense strategy on this choice between continuity versus change? Well, we haven't seen it, and that's a problem in and of itself, right? You can't work off of a fact sheet. You have to see the strategy and read it and understand it. And number two, I don't see them putting forward budgets that would support uh, such a strategy. To his credit, President Trump put forward robust budgets for DOD. So I don't know. The talk seems to be continuity, right? There's talk about great power competition. China is the pacing threat, which I had designated as such during my tenure. And I think we recognize Russia as the number two. But we got to see what the document says and, and how robust it is. And the tough thing of any strategy is not writing, it's implementing it. So what I want to see is implementation of the strategy. That's what I work very hard to do. And I talk about it in detail in my book. So we just got to see. They got to get the strategy out quick. Otherwise, they're going to be halfway through the first term or through their term before we we really know what the what the what the plan is. Yeah, I, I pressed uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks on that, and in her mind, it's out in classified form, and they're working hard against it. Uh, but those of us who aren't privy to the classified document, you know, they're they're, they're guessing. You're right. It, it's it's just a fact sheet and, and doesn't give you a whole lot to work off of. Uh, Secretary Esper, thanks so much for joining. Let's go to the lightning round where we ask you to share your favorite book on President Reagan, your favorite Reagan speech, and a favorite Reagan quote. What do you got? Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I'll, I'll take a pass on the book, um, but I will. There's so many great quotes. It, it's hard to pick one, you know, whether it's the tear down the wall or he's got such funny quips about, you know, after he was shot, you know, asking the, the, the hospital, the surgeons, if they were Republicans or not. But I, the one that really hits most for me uh, that strikes nearest to my heart is his speech. And, and you know, it as the uh, the boys of Point the Hawk speech. And I bring this one up because when I was Army Secretary, I got to go to Normandy for the 75th anniversary. I'd first been there in the early 90s as a paratrooper assigned to Europe. Mm. And so I went there for in uniform uh, to Normandy. And then to be there years later as Army Secretary, to see, go to Point the Hawk, to meet with some of the Rangers that were still alive. But I remember his speech, and I'll just kind of this quote, where he says, quote, these are the boys of Point the Hawk. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free the, a continent. These are the heroes who helped end a war. And uh, the, that's just two sentences, three sentences from a great, great speech. It's a tremendous speech where he spoke to the bravery of these young men, their courage, and what it meant not just then toward, with regard to the freedom of Europe and freeing democracies from fascism, 
but how it related during the time as he fought the Soviets in the Cold War. And I think, look, we're in a new era as well where we have to face down autocracy coming from Beijing and Moscow still. And that's the type of leadership we need in this day and age. I hope, I hope to God it comes soon um, uh, f- from the Republican Party. Secretary Mark Esper, author of A Sacred Oath, thank you so much for joining the show today. Thanks, Roger. Great to be with you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.